interaction for differential forms. So last time I introduced this uh, basic uh, area two form, which was defined uh, as the anti-symmetric tangent product uh, of two basis one forms. Is everywhere. And uh, this this uh, this definition was motivated by wanting to give you something which when I feed it, so this is a zero two tensor, and I feed it two vectors, and uh, it gives me something which is proportional to the area. Um, of the parallelogram defined by these two vectors. And uh, I ended my last lecture introducing the uh, generalized conical delta, which is what we get if I, if I give this uh, area two form to two basis vectors, so let me just call this uh, LM. And I uh, give it uh, I uh, J. And if I just plug it into my definition and use the fact that uh, these area one forms are defined as uh, dual, people would say dual, they just give you a conical delta when you feed the basis vectors into the area one forms, I get this. Uh, Generalize the uh, chronic delta, which is uh, equal to the determinant of all of chronic deltas. Space. 
but uh, indices just go from 1, 2, 3, 4, and uh, that's going to be 0, because this is not a permutation of that. And uh, let's say that. That would also be 0, because the upper indices are, are not a permutation of the lower indices. Good. Um, uh, this would be also equal to 0, because uh, this is a permutation of that, but this is uh, it's anti-symmetric in the upper indices. So it's equal to its negative, which means it's 0. And let me give an example. So that would be equal to 1, because that's an even permutation of that. And that would be equal to minus, let's say, that, because this is an odd permutation of that. Okay, so that's the uh, the Kronecker delta, the, or the generalized Kronecker delta. And uh, now, now that we've got the area two form, uh, the reason we introduced it is we wanted to define the integration of over. We want to define something which would give us integrals over areas in the same way that we used one forms to define. Line integrals. So let's start with some parameterized. So we start with some area, and we imagine that we parameterize this area with some coordinates. So let's say I've got a coordinate u1, and coordinate uh, u2, and these guys give me some parametric representation. Uh, some surface. Okay, and then I've got some, at any point on the surface, I can add a tangent vector to surfaces of constant u1 uh, and surfaces of constant u2. Okay, so let me call that tangent vector u1 and that tangent vector DL2. Okay, and uh, just as we found for um, when, in, when we talked about line integrals, so I'm going to say, for example, DL1 is equal to, okay, so I'll make a small change in D1, and using my chain rule, that's going to be. Uh, du1, um, okay, and it's a vector, it's going to come like that. Okay, so this is, uh, this is the distance in the j direction that I move when I make a change in u1. Okay. And similarly, uh, write dl2, and equal to du2. Once again, please feel free to interrupt me if there's anything uh, that you don't understand. Right. So, um, in general, the so uh, now this now this can be a two-dimensional surface, but in any number of dimensions. So, for each of my two coordinates, for each pair of two coordinates, I'm going to have an area form. So I can uh, I can use my my area form for each pair of coordinates. So I'll have a, each pair of coordinates, I'm going to have an area form, GAJ, and it's equal to uh, which is J. So what that area form is just like the area form I talked about earlier in the XY plane, this will give the area defined by two vectors in the XI, XJ plane. Right. So now we can uh, talk about the integral of a two-form. And remember, I used this uh, subscript in brackets to remind myself that I'm dealing with a two-form. And let me call this this area. I'll call it C2. So I want to define the integral of this two-form over the surface C2. And uh, 
in order to get this integral, I imagine that this two-form is acting on these little infinitesimal length elements in the surface. So this is shorthand for this. That's on DL1 and DL2. And then I just have to calculate what it gives me. So remember, I write F2 is going to be equal to a factor of a half Fij Fij Yeah, and then uh, so I heat into my this is my infant this is my area two form. I feed my length elements into that. Maybe you can check this afternoon that when I do this, so I take this, feed it into there, that, feed it into there. And check that when you do that, you get an integral over the two parameters that I'm using to describe my surface. I get one half f i j, and then I get a. Okay, maybe I should go through this. In, if you guys want me to go through this in detail now. Okay, so let me let me do this in detail. Uh, okay. So now I have d x i, which d x j, and I'm running out of space. But this is going to act on d l one. Uh, DL2. And let me just plug in. Uh, oh, sorry. Okay. Since I'm doing everything in detail, I haven't yet got the, those uh, DUs. So, sorry. Okay. Uh, so then let me plug in my expression for those infinitesimal line elements. So that's a half FIJ uh, DXI, which DXJ. And then that's going to act on uh, d u1, uh, dx i, dx d u1, d i. Okay, so let me use different indices here. Um, let me use m, m, and then I'm going to have d u2. N by du two e n. Good. Okay, then remember our our two form is the is the linear operator, so I can take everything out. So I'm going to have that equal to one half uh, du one. Du two, uh, dx <coughs> m by du one, dx n by du two, and then I have my area form x i x j, and that's acting on e m. E. Okay, and then this guy here. Sorry. I'm Okay, and then this guy here is nothing but the generalized Brummett delta, ijm, m. So finally, okay, I'll get um, integral du1, du2, uh, fij. Delta I, sorry, delta L M I J D X sorry. Multiply the generalized Kronecker delta with that. 
And uh, what I'll find is uh, this is equal to integral p one d u two f m n x m by d u one d u n by d u two. Okay, good. So yeah, y n n instead of uh, l m. Uh, it doesn't matter, I can change it to that. <laughs> as I like, sorry. Sorry, I, I, I accidentally uh, relabeled uh, L, uh, L to M and M to M. Okay. Any other questions? Sorry about that. Yes? If anti-symmetric? Uh, yes, it is anti-symmetric. Okay, but you might be worried, but it's not zero because this isn't symmetric. This is derivative with respect to U1 and that's derivative with respect to U2. And you yeah. also left out the how. It's no, I didn't. Uh, when I conducted this uh, contraction, two ter there were two terms, and uh, that half ended up disappearing. Okay. Uh, good. Um, and once before, we saw there was a lot of work. I went from, um, sorry, here there are, uh, we, one can also check that one can actually write this as just in the old fashioned way as uh, dxi. We're now, this is, these are not, um, these are not one forms, these are just ordinary differentials. A half f i j. Okay, because if I take this integral and I now convert it to an integral over um, these parameters, I have to put down a Jacobian. So, uh, um, there's a shorthand way of writing the Jacobian. I'll do it now and then I'll write out. So this will be equal to du1, du2, times the relevant Jacobian, which will be d. I'll write it like this. This is a way that some people like to write Jacobians. And I'll write it out in full. Okay, so this would be the Jacobian to go from the variables xi, xj, the variables u1, u2, um, and then I have a half f j. Okay, so this Jacobian here is uh, is nothing but the determinant um, of uh, d x i by d u1, d x i by d u2. And uh, if I calculate that determinant and write it out, I get nothing but that. Okay, so my determinant is, is expressed in that terms of that generalized conic delta. Right, question, yeah? Uh, just a little comment along the way in the in the lecture, the uh, the lecture notes they yeah. uh, are are go and other. Okay, we, we can talk about that uh, afterwards. Okay. Uh, good. Um, any other questions? Right. So, um, when, when dealing with forms, uh, you know, I've written everything as, as maps and as filters, but one can often just sort of follow one's nose and uh, Not do everything as um, identically as I'm going to do here. So if I start with this form, okay, and let's say uh, I've got so I'm saying that x i x i is some function of v one. So I've got some parameter, I've got looking at some surface. This is how I'm characterizing my surface. It's a function of the coordinates in terms of two parameters, u1 and u2. And then just using that, I can say that dxi will be equal to um, uh, dxi 
I D U one I D one plus D X I D two U two, and then I can just take that and uh, plug it into there. That can be equal to a half M I J. Uh, okay, I'm going to use some short-term notation. I'm going to write that as x i comma one. Uh, so this will be x i comma one d one plus x i comma two u two, which x j comma one u one plus x j comma two. Okay, now the wedge product is anti-symmetric, so if I have a du1 wedge du1, that's going to be zero, because uh, um, du1 which du1 is going to be just minus du1 which du1, and um, the only thing that's equal to the minus of itself is, is zero. So I can just uh, multiply that out. And uh, I'm going to get the same term twice up to a sign. And exchanging things, I'm going to get f i j dx i comma 1 dx j comma 2 du 1 wedge du 2. Okay, so that's the quick way of going through the whole calculation that just went to of feeding those dl's into the subject. Okay, so uh, I've told you a whole lot of formalism, but often when you do calculations, that's the real way you're going to calculate, not, uh, not the way I just showed you. Okay, that's the way Java would calculate it. Yeah. Right, so uh, as you may guess, I've just done two forms, which is for doing um, area integrals, and then the obvious next thing to consider will be three forms, which are for volume integrals. So the first thing I'm going to define is a, a volume three form, which if I give it three vectors, it's going to give me the volume defined by those three vectors. So let me just try to draw that. So let's say I have three vectors. Um, which are not necessarily orthogonal, uh, but are not parallel. Okay, so if I have three vectors like that, those three vectors are all defined as parallelic, however it's pronounced. The three dimensional generalization of a parallelogram. And uh, So let's say that's uh, A, B, and C. Um, the, the volume of that guy is going to be given by the determinant I get when I write out these three vectors. So I make a matrix which has the columns defined by the three vectors. I take the determinant of that, that gives me the volume. Uh, of this parameter. Okay, so I'm going to define um, a, a volume form, which when I feed it three vectors is going to give me precisely the volume of the parameter that I defined by those three vectors. So the volume form in three dimensions, dx1, dx2, dx3, so that's going to be equal to the alternating sum. I'm just saying alternating sum because I'm lazy to write out uh, all the terms. Uh, dx i, dx j, dx j. Good. So what I mean by alternating sum is if I have a, an even permutation of 1, 2, 3, it comes with a plus sign. If I have an odd permutation of 1, 2, 3, it comes with a minus sign. So for example, let me just write out two terms. So the first term would be 
tensor product g x x three, and then say out of a minus. And then if I take this object, dx1, which dx2, which dx3, and uh, I feed it three vectors, as I suggested, uh, you can check that, okay, so this is going to be, uh, so when, so if I look at the first term here, if I feed a to dx1, that's going to that's gonna give me the component a1. If I feed b to dx2, that's going to give me the component b2. If I give uh, c to dx3, that's going to give me c3. So let me just start to write out. So I get, for example, a1, b2, c3, minus, the other way I've written there, I get a2, uh, b1, D1, and then I get C3, plus dot, 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 dot. And uh, I can express all those terms, as I told you in the beginning, that's going to be equal to the determinant A2. Okay, and you can check that uh, by hand if you want to, just by writing everything out explicitly. There's just uh, quite a few terms to write out that I don't feel like writing out. Okay, so in particular, if I if I take this form and I act on my basis vectors, I'm going to get another generalized chronic delta. So in particular, uh, okay. now I'm going to have to be a little bit careful. Get all the indices right. Okay, so I take that object and I feed it uh, E L and E M and E N. And uh, so that's going to be equal to the determinant of let me do this. equal to that determinant of chronic deltas, and I'm going to give this a special name. I'm going to call this the, this is a chronic delta, generalized chronic delta. Good. And this generalized chronic delta has exactly the same properties as the first generalized chronic delta I gave you. It can either have values uh, 1, 0, or minus 1. Yeah, question. Uh, on the the last uh, dx, yeah, dx, j, uh, and which... Oh, sorry, yes, that should be a... That should be a K, thank you. Okay. Um, good. So this has the same properties as the, um, the two-dimensional chronic delta. It takes on values minus one, zero, or one. It's zero if the upper indices are not a permutation of the lower indices. It's completely anti-symmetric in the upper indices and the lower indices, and um, the upper indices are an even permutation of the lower indices, it gives you a plus one, the upper indices are an odd permutation of the lower indices, it gives you a minus one. Good. So, um, this was the wedge product of uh, this, of, uh, of this, that was my volume form, and inspired by the volume form we can define a general wedge product, <coughs> any uh, three one forms. So I can define here okay, now, so given three one forms, P, Q, R. Let me actually write the whole thing out. Here I'm going to define the wedge product of those three one forms as the alternating sum 
an alternating sum of tensor products. So I'm going to write this as P Q R. So that's the first term. Uh, my uh, plus Q R P.
So I'll write the three form like that. <coughs> three over there reminds me I'm dealing with the three, the three index object. So I'll write it as one over two factorial. We'll have components F, J, K, and have D, X, I. Okay, and uh, you can check that given this definition, if I indeed feed that form, uh, let's say E, L, E, M, E, N, you can check that indeed that gives me F, L, M, N. Okay, so that's why we write it that way, so that when we feed it the basis vectors, the component comes out. Okay, any questions? So in the same way that we had area integrals, you can define volume integrals. And I won't go through the calculation as much detail as I went through last time. I'll just write out the, the results and get. And uh, you can check it for yourselves. So now we can define an integral of a three form over some volume. So I imagine now that I've uh, parameterized my volume with three, three parameters, u1, u2, and u3. So maybe let me, okay, so I have some volume. And uh, that volume is going to have some parameters u1, u2, and uh, imagine okay. that's a horrible picture. Okay, just imagine I have some volume which I've parameterized in terms of the three parameters uh, u1, u2. Anti-symmetric 
Good. And then I, so I'll define the, the p dimensional volume form. So let's say I1, which p I2, yes, I p. Oops. So that's going to be equal to the alternating sum over the tensor product. And uh, so that would be in, uh, in a p-dimensional Euclidean space, but I could also do this in, uh, in space-time, rather than this uh, Euclidean space, so in space-time I could find something like that. Okay. And uh, I would write generic p-form. Uh, in general form of P form would be one over P factorial F mu one mu two all the way up to mu P F B X mu one F B X two dot 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 all the way up to B X mu P and uh, with that definition you can check that it gives me the right expression for the components. <laughs> so if I took FP and uh, set it uh, here, uh, E mu1, E mu2, E mu p, uh, that's going to be equal to 1 over p factorial. Uh, F mu1, mu2, all the way up to mu p. And when I feed these basis vectors into uh, that volume form, I get a generalized conical delta. Places these uh, mu mu's with nu's, and it does a p factorial times. So this indeed gives me one, two, seven, okay, and that's why we have this factor of one over p factorial when you write out the one form like that in terms of the uh, basis p forms. Right. Um, good and. Uh, then in, uh, we can also define general volume form, volume integrals. How am I doing for time? Uh, 15 minutes, good. Okay, we might actually... Get a little bit better. Okay, so I can define... Uh, over some p dimensional volume, I can find the integral of a p form. So that's going to be equal to the integral. So now I imagine my p dimensional volume is parameterized by uh, x, x uh, mu is equal to mu, say, ui. And uh, this will now run over. Okay, well, let me use a different letter. N say, <coughs> so that N will run over from 1 to P. So it will be P parameters which uh, parameterize that volume. So that will be P of DL1 uh, all the way up to DL, DLP. And as I did for the two dimensional integral, I plug that in. I'm going to get an integral over the parameterized the parameters of my surface and uh, U, uh, P, M of P, F, U1, U2. Okay, so basically, 
very similar formula to what I had before, except now there are p variables instead of two or three. And once again, this is exactly the same thing I would get if I just wrote down one over p factorial dx d1 all the way to dx mu p uh, of f mu1 mu p. And then if I calculate the Jacobian to go from the x coordinates to the u coordinates, which parameterize my surface, you can check you would get exactly that formula. Okay. Right. And then, uh, so finally, let me just uh, mark up. So it's not hard to see that if we're in p dimensions, there are no p plus 1 forms. So, uh, in p dimensional space, oh, I'd rather say no non trivial p plus 1 forms. Okay, the zero, I guess, is the form. Okay, so for example, in, in, if I had three spatial dimensions, uh, if I tried to write down a four form, let's say I had d plus 1, which d is. Okay, so I'm in two dimensions, those are all the basis one forms that I have. So I have to pick another one, let's say, which dx3, now this is going to be anti-symmetric. This is going to be zero because uh, if I exchange that I'm going to get a minus sign. So that's equal to zero. So you can't make a uh, high dimensional forms in the space because you'll always have to repeat one of the basis forms but it has to be an anti-symmetric so you're going to get uh, zero and uh, so let me write finally uh, if I want to multiply together any a p and a q form how can I do that? I want to take a wedge product of a p and a q form so I'm just going to define the wedge product of a p and a q form in the simplest possible way. So let's say I have p form, wedge, uh, a q form. Okay, so let me write out how I would write out a and b. So that would be one over p factorial mu a mu dot dot dx mu wedge blah 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 dx mu. Okay, so it will be P of these, and uh, then I would wedge that with 1 over Q factorial, D, whatever I use here, okay, D alpha, that's beta, so D X alpha, X beta. Okay, now they're going to be Q of these forms. Right, and uh, so that's going to be equal to 1 over P, P factorial, A, mu, sorry. Two form, 
So it turns out that result generalizes. So uh, what these things do is they pick out the anti-symmetric part of this product. And you can check that this afternoon. Okay, question, yeah. So you could just explain So you want me to go back and explain this? Okay, good. Okay, so I've, I've tried here, I've tried to write down some P plus 1 form. I've tried to write down a full form in three dimensional space. Uh, I wrote down the first three basis forms. In order to get a fourth one, I have to repeat either 3, 2, or 1. For convenience, I just repeated 3 because uh, it's at the end. Now, the, this, the wedge product is anti symmetric, so if I exchange this one and that one, I'm going to pick up a minus sign. So this is going to be equal to minus. And then the only thing that's equal to the negative of itself uh, is zero. So this has to be zero. So there are no four forms in three-dimensional space. Yeah, another question. Uh, you, the definition of your form, um, yeah. in the beginning you mentioned that you were working with the Euclidean space. Yes. I just want to know, would one have to treat the time coordinate differently in the Kasi space? Um, no. Okay, so the, the only difference is um, here, when I, the only difference here, whether I write this in Euclidean space or in, uh, in uh, space time, one of these DLs might be timelike, uh, depending on the surface I've chosen. Okay, so that's the only, in terms of the mechanics of what I've explained to you, that's the only difference. Okay, and obviously you've got, when you're raising in lower indices, you might pick up science, etc., etc. But, uh, in terms of the mechanics of the forms, everything's very, very similar. Yeah, another question. Uh, can you think of the which product of P form and Q form as an error P plus Q form? Yes, exactly. <clears throat> so this is good. So this is going to, sorry, yes, yeah, so I was interrupted. So let me go back to, to this calculation. Now, I, I'm calculating the wedge product of a P and a Q form, and that's going to give me a P plus Q form. Yeah, because you can see. Uh, it's written in terms of uh, uh, it's multiplied at some indices which multiply the P plus Q uh, volume form. Right. So, good. So, indeed, um, this object here is some uh, P, plus, uh, P plus Q form. So I would write this as um, uh, this must be also this must also be equal to one over p plus q factorial, and now times the components of this p plus q form. So this is some p plus q form. Um, new one up to beta of dx mu when dx beta. OK, so indeed, because this is a p plus q form, I should write it like this. And then this now allows me to work out what the components of, or how I should write out uh, this p plus q form. If I compare this one and that one, I now can see that the components of this uh, P plus Q form just comparing the left hand and right hand side there uh, okay so these are going to write from U beta multiplying through by the fact of P plus Q factorial so I get P plus Q factorial divided by P factorial Q factorial A mu Uh, and people have a special way of writing. Does anybody know shorthand for how I could write that? So, so I'm going to fork yeah, okay, so people write it as this is if I have if I have P plus Q things and I choose P of them, I get that combinatorial factor. So
Okay, so this formula tells you if I tell you the components of this P, this uh, P form and the components of the Q form, this tells you the components of the P plus Q form I get when I multiply them together. Okay. Thank you for what you're Sorry? Uh, just on the red line from the bottom, P plus Q, where you have A, P, H, Q, you need to get a B there. Uh, sorry, where? Sorry, I forgot a B there. Sorry. sorry, on which line? Sorry? Yeah, that's on that. Sorry? Yeah, I was saying that. Oh, yeah, I forgot the B. <laughs> yes. Uh, I forgot the, the Q form. Okay, good. Any other questions? Right, and uh, if you look at this uh, derivation carefully, we can see how um, we can commute in Q form. So, from that derivation, you can see that A, P, wedge, uh, EQ is equal to minus 1. Uh, of P times Q, B, uh, B, Q, H, A, B. Okay, and uh, the reason that is, is if I, if I instead wrote B, Q, H, A, P, if I wanted to go from one to the other, I would have to take all these P forms through. Um, so here I have, um, so here I have P, Q, uh, one forms and there are Q forms. So if I wanted to commute these things, I'd have to take each of these through, so I'd have to commute each of these with those P objects. So if I took the first time, first A, A alpha and I commuted it through all of those, I'd pick up a minus sign, so I'd pick up minus one to the P. I have to do that Q times. So when I exchange the order, I get minus one P to the Q, which is minus one P times Q. Right, so that tells you that uh, even forms, uh, you, know, you can work out the various options op op you get, whether you multiply even forms with even forms, odd forms with even forms, and two odd forms. Okay, uh, well, let me, let me just summarize the reaction. So, even forms, Commute with everything. Okay, because if either P or Q is uh, even, that's going to give you uh, um, something even. And odd forms anti commute with each other. Okay, because if P and Q are both odd, P times Q is odd, so that gives you minus one. Okay. So I think that's probably a good point to stop. And uh, next time I'll talk about uh, one of the last ingredients we need before we really start using forms to do physics, which is something called the Hodge dual, which allows you to map uh, certain forms to certain other forms. Okay, thank you.